And I want you to start thinking, try to think about what kind of diagnosis you can make for this patient. You don't have to get it spot on, I don't expect anyone to, but if you can get within the ballpark of what you think the person has, then I think it'll be successful. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to present the case to you, give you the, uh, the patient's symptoms, his history, give him what he, what he got at the hospital and what the doctors did to him. Then I'm going to ask you what you think your diagnoses are, give you the differential diagnosis, which is what the doctors went through step by step, trying to eliminate possible diagnoses and um, address possible diagnoses that could also happen. And then I'm going to finally give you the solution you had, because I'm not going to keep you in suspense. So the patient history before he arrived at any hospital, um, this is previous diseases he might have had, previous symptoms that he might have had, and this can be almost just as important as current symptoms that he has because this can help eliminate certain things. Like for example, he's an old person, which means that he probably won't have diseases that will affect children, but that may be immunocompromised. He has a weakened immune system, so he's more susceptible to things like tuberculosis. Uh, he has a history of urinary tract infections, so that means that you can't eliminate the possibility of a urinary tract infection because when he arrives at the hospital, you don't know what he has at all. Um, he's married and works in an office, which seems random, but this can give a clue to the lifestyle of the patient. So he's married, which means he probably doesn't have any uh, SCI, sexually transmitted disease, and he works in an office, so he's not working with bugs and animals all the time, so that narrows it down. Um, he lives in an urban area of New England, which tells you a little more about his lifestyle. He doesn't lead a very adventurous life, but he did visit a forested region. Forests have bugs, mosquitoes, ticks, funguses, things like that. Um, but he had no known tick exposures during that visit. He drank alcohol in moderation and did not use illicit drugs. Narrows it down even further. He probably doesn't have hepatitis C, something like that, that heroin users might have, and he probably doesn't have any liver problems. So you can eliminate liver problems there. Just before admission to the other hospital, he had he was in usual health about one week before. Uh, that's when he developed fevers and increased urinary frequency. He visited his doctor, and his doctor thought it might be a urinary tract infection, prescribed antibiotics that would treat that, and he had a partial improvement of his symptoms until two days before admission, where he developed flu-like symptoms, so fatigue, sleepiness, fever, and he appeared confused, which means altered mentation. They'll mention that later on. And so he was taken to the emergency department of a hospital. And at that other hospital, they did a basically a basic they did a basic report on his symptoms. You can see he had an increased temperature, that's fever. Normal temperature should be 36.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, Increased blood pressure. Blood pressure should be 120 over 80. Some people might have hypertension, chronic hypertension, but it should be 120 over 80. 72 beats per minute is a little high. Um, it's within the normal range of heart rate, but it's a little high. And 16 breaths per minute, which I'm, you know, it varies. If you're resting or you're exercising, it's different. But that's about one breath every four seconds. I think that's pretty normal. Um, they keep mentioning he was confused and did not follow commands. That just means that he was in an altered mental state. You kind of can understand why, um, if he has a flu or it's affecting his nerves. And your analysis, which basically means you pee into a cup and they put a dipstick in, I'm sure you've seen these, and they basically measure pH, different things, different levels in the blood, and they show, and show that there was a small amount of blood, a small amount of bacteria, and a small amount of uh, epithelial cells. Epithelial cells. So, a little out of, not, not much out of the ordinary. Should there be a little bit of blood in the urine? No, but, you know, he's had renal uh, disease, so his blood is not going to be as normal as other people. But, I mean, the fact that there was only occasional bacteria and not a lot indicates that he probably does not have a urinary tract infection. That's what the doctors could use to rule that out. So at the other hospital, what they did there was they did a chest radiograph and a CT scan. These aren't pictures from the article. I picked these out to help you visualize what was going on. So this is a chest radiograph, basically taking x-ray of the chest. And that can show you if there's anything in the lungs that might be wrong, like pneumonia, if there's any fluid buildup. Uh, but it was normal. That's a normal chest radiograph. 
and a CT scan, basically they can, using, um, putting you in this kind of disc, they can take a slice of your brain, not an actual slice, but they can take an image of it, and they can see if there's any buildup of fluids, things like that. And both were normal, so you can eliminate, you know, chest problems and sort of brain fluid buildup problems. They administered some uh, antibiotics to treat urinary tract infection. They keep doing that. I, I don't agree with that, but they did. And they noted that he was still confused. And he had an increased work of breathing, which means he was breathing harder and coughing, which was strange for me. They don't explain the symptoms, they just give them to you. It was strange for me because um, you know, he didn't have any upper respiratory tract problems. And then he was transferred to the Massachusetts General Hospital, which is the hospital that actually released this case report. So at the Massachusetts General Hospital, they did another review of his uh, status. He still has a fever. His uh, blood pressure increased a little bit. His heart rate decreased a little bit. It's more normal, but his breathing rate increased. That's about one breath every two seconds. So that's much faster. Um, so confused. And his tone was increased in the arms, which means that his arms were a little more stiff. Um, and with cogwheel rigidity and myoclonus, cogwheel rigidity is um, it's sort of a part of Parkinson's where it's on, upon passive muscle movement where you move the arm, it shakes, and myoclonus is twitching, basically. So that can tell you, it sounds fancy, but it basically tells you that things are going wrong with his nervous system. There's something wrong in his brain. So it's not, probably might not be just the flu, you don't know. Um, you know, maybe it's affecting his brain like a minor stroke. So, Derek, we're up on the, uh, we are? Yeah, so you can do multiple choice. So just put up A, B, C in what you want. All right. Or I can turn it into a uh, text you're answering. So, so far we know that he has a fever. I don't know if I should write these all up. Do you guys remember what he has? So he has a fever. Um, he has altered mental status. He has, he's been administered drugs for a urinary tract infection, but he doesn't necessarily have one, probably, due to the urinalysis. Uh, his chest radiograph is normal. His, um, he has a history, his mother had a history of, I don't know if that was actually a bullet point. I might have deleted that, but I didn't mean to. His mother had a history. His mother died in her 30s of an intracranial stroke. So he's at risk for a stroke. Um, that's why that could be a possible cause. What do you guys think he has? I mean, go ahead and enter it. Any guesses? Oh, I'm here. I'm here. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. What would you say the symptoms? Shaking, shaking. Uh, myoclonus. It was pretty much myoclonus and talking. Yeah. Um, the second the brain was so it's affecting the central nervous system. All right, Derek, we've got stroke, brain, bacteria, syphilis, and malaria so far. All right. Well, those are good. I actually thought malaria was one of the causes when I first read it. You know, I was. I didn't know quite. Oh, three people think it's a virus. Wow. If you read the article, if you walk by one of the panels, then you know what it is. Tumor, dengue, fever, more stroke. I'll get to it because the next part is what a real diagnosis. All right, all you. Alright, anyway. Hey, he's a really popular 39 or 79 year old guy. He could be living a double life. The point was, I want you guys to start thinking about the symptoms and then using those symptoms to back up why you chose that. I, I, dengue fever makes sense to me, tumor might make sense to me. Um, his symptoms are not that clear, the fact that they're just like flu like symptoms and the fact that he's confused. Did they take an MRI? Um, they did, but I didn't include the picture because it was a little confusing. It didn't show much except that there was a little bit of fluid buildup at one, at like one point in his brain. Meningitis. Meningitis is a, uh, you know, the effect of what was happening. 
Okay, so differential diagnosis is what the, this is what the doctor went through. I'm going to go through some of the diseases that the doctor thought might be and tell you which ones are poss the doctor confirmed would be possible and which ones he knew would be false. And I'm going to build a list of what he thought it might be. Mr. Diaz, a list of what you thought it might be. We can see where they coincide and start trying to eliminate which ones can't be. So some notes beforehand, just, you know, uh, this is just some terminology. Cushing's response is a triad of hypertension, uh, which means increased blood pressure, bradycardia, which is decreased heart rate, and I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, increased heart rate, and respiratory depression, which is decreased breathing. Um, this is indicative of increased intracranial pressure, which basically means the brain is inflamed. There's something in the brain. Um, so he has hypertension. He doesn't have a severely decreased heart rate, but he's somewhat decreased. And but his respiratory depression is not decreased, is not there. But you can eliminate it. Um, we should still consider this. And remember, his mother did die of an. Uh, his mother did die of stroke, so he could have a minor stroke that may describe some of his symptoms. And I guess that's okay. So. He goes through different categories. He goes through bacterial causes, um, viral causes, parasites, and fungus infections. I'm just going to label a few of the diseases that he said, a few of the um, pathogens that he mentioned that might be causing this, just because I think it's interesting. I like to learn about diseases. That's weird. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> bacterial infection uh, that causes encephalitis, which is um, Meningoencephalitis, which could, which is infection of the brain, causes fever, mucositosis, which is means activation of the immune system, and altered medication, which is being confused like he was. So possible causes are urinary tract infection, infection of the central nervous system, and tick-borne infection. Um, tick-borne infection was included in there probably because he visited a forested region where there's ticks. Nobody guessed tick-borne. There were no ticks. But mosquitoes were a good uh, were a good guess because remember he visited the forest. I can I can know, I can see why he didn't choose tick form though because his wife reported that he wasn't bitten by a tick. I guess he shouldn't rule it out. Anyway, urinary tract infections. Remember we said were unlikely. Uh, he was not responsive to antibiotics. The urinalysis did not show much bacteria. But you know urinary tract infections could be caused by Escherichia coli. That's it's an abundant virus. There's many different strains. It's not necessarily bad, but it can be. But there can be uh, pathogenic strains that cause that can cause bacteremia, which gets which means the bacteria gets into your bloodstream and circulates throughout your body, can get in the brain and start causing disease. But we can eliminate urinary tract infection. I'm just going to say that because that's what the people say. that's what the doctors say. Uh, but that still leaves infection of the central nervous system and tick-borne. So, with in infection of the central nervous system, it can cause bacterial meningitis. Meningitis is um, inflammation of the membrane around the brain. Inflammation of the brain, basically. And uh, bacteria that can cause that are Streptococcus pneumoniae. They have a little picture. <laughs> Just to note, the coccus means berry. Coccus <laughs> in Greek means berries. That's why they look like little spheres, little berries. Those kinds of bacteria will look like that. I just think that's cool. I think it's interesting. Um, risk factors for Streptococcus pneumoniae are elderly people and children, uh, people who are immunocompromised. Um, <coughs> if they get into the bloodstream, they can cause meningitis. Another cause could be Listeria mono, monocytogenes, I think is how you pronounce it. And this is actually a foodborne illness, and it's very, you know, very, very limited. Uh, what it does is it can get into the bloodstream, multiply inside your cells, get inside the brain, and start causing meningitis. Basically, both of them get into the brain. Um, these are just two examples. I could have just said bacterial meningitis, but these are two examples because I have to learn about the disease that could be causing the infection. So I bolded that. We could be bacterial infection. Okay. Yep. For either of those, how long does it take from the start of original of uh, initial like fever-like symptoms, especially for doctors, for example, um, and then until it gets into the brain through the bloodstream? I wouldn't know for sure. I think it's hard to tell because for different people, the immune system is the strength is different. But I think you know, I wouldn't say a month, but I wouldn't say five days. Okay. Probably weeks or so. And then we have tick-borne infection. 
Uh, Lyme's disease is the most well-known tick-borne. I was actually sorry. I was going to ask you what tick-borne infection is here. But Lyme disease is the most well-known one. It's uh, transferred through the deer tick. And basically, I have, I have another picture because it also looks cool. It's like spiral pasta. And, you know, I think it's also fun to know, it's good to know what different shapes of bacteria there are. There's streptococcus, which are the little balls. There's rod-shaped bacteria. There's bacteria with flagellates. <laughs> and then there is a spiral bacteria. Um, I don't know why Lyme disease is shaped like that, but it, sorry, yes. Could you please demonstrate the flagellate? <laughs> <laughs> they can have two all over. <laughs> I don't know why Lyme disease is shaped like that, but I do know actually that some gastrointestinal bacteria are shaped like spirals so that they can get lodged, e easier, more easily be lodged in the cell wall, which you know, causes disease. Um, Another tick-borne infection is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, and this is an example of the bacteria actually in the cell, so that can show you a little bit about that. Um, so tick-borne infection could be a cause because he was in a forested region. I'm going to write that down. What are the general symptoms for Lyme and Rocky Mountain? They are central nervous system diseases, so I know with Lyme disease, depending on the site where you were bitten, it can take a while before it gets to this, uh, the nervous system, but it's generally flu-like symptoms up until that point. Then you start to get confused and things like that. It takes about several weeks to a couple of months, they say, with Lyme disease. Um, the next two I thought were just interesting in terms of why they mentioned it. This one, because this name is interrogans, which if you take Latin, you know, means something like questioning or asking. And I thought, why would a bacteria be asking you anything? And it's because under a microscope it looks like a question mark. I can't see it, but I guess at one point it looked like a question mark and they decided to name it that. You can also see it's another spiral bacteria. And then syphilis, which must be another tick-borne infection, but um, it was almost immediately ruled out because this is a married guy, so he probably does not have syphilis. Again, it's a spiral shaped bacteria. So we eliminate those. So far, in, in addition to what you guys thought it might be, which diagnoses do you think we can rule out? You can go ahead and enter it on your cell phone. Out. Which ones are you going to rule out? Like Which ones do you think it can't be? Because um, we went over... What? Um, we want the same for fever-like symptoms. Um, that the rash develops in some cases. We're 50-50 syphilis and tick right now. Syphilis? Yeah. We eliminated syphilis though. Unless I was going to Well, I guess they're right then. It can't be syphilis. Alright, well, I don't know. We'll see. But, I mean, I'm just trying to go through symptoms and maybe what the doctor says could give an indication to you why it can't be um, I have to move along. I'll tell you that these two fungal infections and mycobacterial are not it. One, because the only risk factor for this is getting a spinal injection of a drug. Um, the only known case where people have died, been infected and died from that was from one infected batch of anti-inflammatory medicine that was injected into the spine. So, can't do that. Tuberculosis could, couldn't be because, you know, tuberculosis isn't lung infection. The lung did not show any problems, so it can't be those two. Parasites, this is an interesting one. I spent a lot of time on this slide with pictures. Uh, have you guys heard of Nyglaria cholerae? Have you heard of the brain-eating amoeba? This is an actual picture of it. It's kind of scary, so I'm confused. Um, it's probably not this either, because it's mostly found in people that go jump into lakes or infected lakes, people in their 20s that go swimming, things like that. More people that use, some people have gotten to using many pots, weird things with the teapot that you put up to your nose and the water comes out. But that's the only reason. Um, it's kind of, it's not a scary name, and it is kind of scary because it does eat your brain. It gets up into your nose, uh, starts eating your olfactory bulbs, then walks along the nerve into your brain and starts eating it. It's kind of scary, but the patient probably doesn't have it. Probably not a parasite. So we move on to the next slide, viral infections causing meningoencephalitis. And, you know, 
West Nile virus. Malaria wasn't the cause because I think malaria probably isn't found in the Northeast, so they didn't mention it. But the West Nile virus is a virus. It's different from bacteria, as you might know. Uh, they, have, they can't survive on their own. They need a host. This is basic viral stuff you probably know. This is a picture of the artist representation of the protein enveloped for the West Nile virus. So here's an actual picture zoomed in. They don't provide a scale, but these things are really small. They can infect cells like that. And during, his during the patient's presentation, there was actually an outbreak of West Nile virus. Um, so that you know lends more to the fact that it could be West Nile virus. Those are all the possible causes. We went through bacterial infection, tick infection, parasitic infection, fungal infection, and viral infection. Out of those five, we picked three, bacterial infection, tick infection, and virus, that could have been causing his symptoms. That's the last slide for the differential diagnosis. Um, I, I don't know if you guys want to vote again. So what do you think? What's now virus? Do we agree? All right. That explains most of the symptoms. And you'd be right. Plus, I think the title was something Yeah. I just said the interesting case of a 76 year old man. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. You know, you should really keep stuff like that to yourself. Just send your really intelligent. But as a final thought, the oh, you gonna okay. As a final thought, the doctor did say that given the symptom of meningitis, given the disease of meningoencephalitis, without any symptoms, uh, he said the most likely cause would be herpes simplex one. Um, he didn't say why. He just said that's the most common cause. So given no symptoms. That could be a cause of meningoencephalitis. I thought that'd be interesting. And so I didn't just tell you this to tell you that some guy got West Nile virus. <laughs> I want you to think critically. That's a part of my presentation. Um, a lot of science is based on the fact that you have to, you know, you have to eliminate certain possibilities and given a set of information, make educated guesses about what's right and what's wrong. And if you're wrong, then you have to figure out why you're wrong. You have to learn. That's about science. The end. <laughs> Guys, you can email any questions you want, or you can enter any question you have for Derek right now on your phone. Um, can we please help push the desks together? They go in groups.